So th thanks again, Phoebe, for the very, very fine uh, introduction. Um, it's really a real pleasure to be here, especially you know, seeing all friends and, and all colleagues. So uh, what I'm going to present is essentially four episodes, um, short episodes. They are interrelated, but they, on the one hand, they do not directly run in a linear fashion, but I think you can begin to draw uh, a certain uh, uh, coherence between them. And from there on, hopefully we can uh, take take questions. So I've titled my presentation, uh, Typology Beyond Rossi, in part really um, is to find a way, really to looking at this image, to find a way to, uh, when confronted with, with, with a situation like this, when we started to practice, is to find a way to understand, describe, and project an architecture for what I call our developmental cities in Asia. And in particular, uh, what I'll talk about today is in China and in Singapore. And that there should be, in a way, a theoretical and pedagogical framework um, that one could opt into that allows a certain engagement, but also a certain critical uh, um, uh, uh, engagement and, and projection in, in situation of a globalized production of architecture in, in, in a globalized city. So obviously, as you know, so uh, I've looked into the pedagogy and the theoretical framework of type and typology. But of course, an understanding that this understanding has to be revalidated as the concept of type in architecture is actually really firmly rooted and originated from the traditions uh, of Western Enlightenment. So what is instrumental for me, at least, uh, is that the concept of type uh, is most useful way is that it is heuristic in nature. And this is really made evident in, in Wittler's uh, three, typo uh, three typological moments. Uh, and in which uh, architecture's agency and efficacy had to be revalidated every time architecture is deemed to be in crisis. So the first three typologies here, uh, very, very quickly summarized here, the first one found their justification for political and sociality from nature, from the machine, and from the historical city, respectively. And as time is short, uh, my point of departure will really be from the third via the historical uh, European city. So, but first, before we, okay. So first, I think um, I think some definition uh, is important so that it could guide us through this discussion. So for me, the concept of type uh, is a heuristic tool used to uncover or revalidate commonly held idea or ideal that forges a link between the concreteness of architecture and the wider context in which it serves. Typology, on the other hand, or the logic of type, is the moment of analysis in architecture. It is a comparative method that brings together buildings that share similar characteristics for study. The goal is to distill their typicalities as irreducible organizational structure or deep structure, ready to be deployed into new variation and reconfiguration. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the context, that, as, as I mentioned, uh, the third moment of typology from the late 60s onward uh, was in a way a characterization uh, characterized by the general disillusionment and failure of the unitary um, uh, master plan of, of architectural modernism in the way in which it fails to respond and reflect the reality uh, of the complexity of urban life. So Rossi's architecture of the city really brings is an attempt to revalidate the idea or the ideal of architecture that could return to no longer to the machine, to the nature, and, and uh, as, as we've seen, that has run previously, but recuperate the, uh, the validity of architecture from the historical city. And what I mean by that is that the concept of the urban, what is most important for Rossi is the concept of the urban artifact. And in principle, the urban artifact for Rossi is divided to two. Uh, he calls it uh, the moment of housing and the moment of the monument. And the way in which he begins to talk about that um, in, in very, very simple terms, I would argue that it summarizes the way in which we understand historical European city is essentially is a city made of rule and exception. The rule being that housing typologies that surrounds and which is also separate, that makes the punctuated building visible. And the punctuated buildings are essentially exceptions. Exceptions because they are the manifestation of collective will and a political space. 
And in a way, this could also be made more explicit in this page uh, from the architecture of the city by Rossi, in which he used the example of Palazzo Ragione to describe why this is an urban artifact. Now, he argues that this is an urban artifact precisely because it is a building that has been involved in the life of the city. And because it has been involved in the life of the city, it is a propelling element. And because it is a propelling element, it is also uh, independent of programmatic failures. That is to say that this, the same structure has remained permanent, but has allowed the life of programmatic life to occur within the building. It changes from a military barrack to an aristocrat building, to a marketplace, to a school, for instance. And because it accretes and allowed uh, different programs to filter through the building, it also in a way becomes a mnemonic structure. That is to say that it is a, 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 an urban artifact that, that, that bears within itself and indexes the collective memory of the city. Now, one of the key things that I found that is usually not discussed much in Ross's work is the diagram that we see on the bottom right. Uh, what I would call the irreducible structure of the palazzo, in which we see that in Rossi's 1972 article that is called Due Progretti, that was um, written in Italian, uh, in which the same irreducible structure that we have seen in the previous slide is then used subsequently for the abstracted and then subsequently used in his other projects in which we could uh, confidently say that they are the project of the city. At the top, essentially, is the uh, is his building of Milan Triennale. The middle two is the uh, irreducible structure of Galarata's uh, housing, and then at the bottom is San Rocco. And this is what he says uh, in 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 the first project. He says that the site plan of the Milan project summarizes the form of every rectilinear continuous pathway, uh, and in which you could say that the same deep structure that we saw in the palazzo here is transposed as an exhibition space with a spatial dimension that contracts and expands as you move from left to right and also a space that has a certain depth that begins to mediate between the street and a, and a stream or a river at the back. So I would say that in a way the same treatment of that irreducible structure of the city is also transposed in this very famous project in which you, you you should know this by now. So what I would like to highlight is that here we see two moments of the urban artifact. On the top floor are the irreducible structure that allows rooms that creates dwelling, but the same structure is then imprinted partially on the ground floor, so that they are both porticos as well as a street. And it is precisely the street, which is a public space, as well as dwelling space, which is a private, that brings together those two moments that I have spoke to you about, housing and monument, into a singular architectural project of the city. And Rossi always says this, he says that it is precisely a, a, a building like this, that is an open structure that is awaiting for social life to unfold. So the next chapter, chapter uh, two, I would call the historical city, but is uh, how, and but of course it's looking at from the Eastern point of view. So I would say that uh, returning to my question, uh, my opening question, when we look at fast growing cities like this in Asia, especially in the past two decades, it really requires us to further what we understand uh, from Rossi. And I would argue that um, ultimately Rossi's idea of the city in a way corresponds, th that corresponds to the urban artifact or the monument of housing, rise, rests really upon Aristotle's understanding of the polis, right? And I will run through this very quickly. Uh, the, the quote here is an opening sentence of Aristotle polis. Essentially, he says that observation shows us first that every city is a species of association. And secondly, that all association come into being for the sake of some good. So in other words, we could say that the space of politics, the polis, is a space that is once that is separate from the, the moment of housing, which is a, uh, uh, the, the space of economics, which is the management of the family. 
And in and the space of politics is the space of free men, right? Free men, women today, that comes together to, for the collective life. So it is not unusual to see that, therefore, the artifact of the city resides in this moment of rule and exception. So as a city of rule and exception, the city consisting of urban artifacts becomes one of the key irreducible way in which we understand the historical European city. Now, in the tradition of city making in Asia, let's say in China, I, I would use the imperial city pre-1948 in Beijing, I, I would argue that the city is conceived less as artifacts, but more as a common framework. So here you see that the, the, there, is, there is no exception, but there's only room. Now, why I say that is that you can see that there is only one dominant type within uh, the, the, uh, the imperial city, and they are the uh, what you would call the wall courtyard house. Now, the wall courtyard house should not be confused with the courtyard block that we find in the European city. The wall courtyard house essentially consists of several pavilions placed almost in a checkerboard way that is then surrounded by a wall. Now, why this is important is that uh, the city that is constructed through this dominant type really reifies the ethics of Confucianism and the importance of unity, community, harmony, and balance. And the closest Chinese counterpart to Aristotle is actually Sun, uh, Sun Tzu. And it accounts, uh, this is written three, almost 300 years BC, and it accounts for the origins of society and the state. And in Sun Tzu's 32 chapter, it exemplifies the philosophical ethics of Confucianism that considers the family unit actually as one that is naturally harmonious and one that provides the training ground for morality that serves as a bridge between individuality and society. Mm -hmm. And it is the family structure, as opposed to what Aristotle has said, that is seen and is used as a model for the state. So in other words, there is no separation from the space of economics and the space of city, but it's actually one that is encompasses all under one heaven. So therefore, it is unlike the European city uh, that has centers of concentration and marked by an architectural exception, exception as monuments set apart by housing, the Chinese city can be viewed as a monument in its entirety. It is made up of one uh, dominant type, as I mentioned, and its architecture serves as a background, a neutral structure that defines and accommodates the plurality of life. So the Chinese city as such could be seen as a common framework. So in this worldview, the genesis of the city is the manifestations of a, rural, a ruler's authority to lead in all spheres of human existence. Although it requires labor and expertise and people, the imperial city will not be possible without the tacit involvement of the emperor. So here you can see that the limits of the city is set by walls and gates, in a drawing or a diagram by the state and within in which all life uh, unfolds. So the city is just a total construction of the reified universe that includes everything under one heaven. So another important philosophical tradition that underpins the idea of the city is the bipolar, bipolarity uh, of yin and yang. So these two terms can be explained only in reference to the other, unlike the dualistic opposition. So each term in a bipolar relationship requires the other. Yin has no meaning without yang. So in Western binaries, dualistic terms are autonomous. So for instance, nature can be understand uh, can be independent from culture. But in the Chinese uh, polarism, it is not dialectical. It does not follow the Hegelian progression from contradiction to, to synthesis to, sub, uh, to sublation. So in the Chinese tradition, the yin and yang are not dualistic extreme of light and dark, male and female, but rather a point along a movement of flow. So in this manner, each of the term of polarism is involved in one or the other. One that is in, in, in reality is a shade and a gradient or an intensity of the other. So in terms of a philosophical and a political concept, it is not about an enemy or a friend, but it's an always an, uh, it's a propensity towards resolving uh, a conflict via the accommodation of one uh, to the other within a larger 
overarching framework. So therefore, it is in this description, therefore, it is not unusual to say that the imperial Chinese city is made up of rule with no exception. The same courtyard house that houses a dwelling of a family is also used and for an administrative co uh, 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 complex, is used as a clinic, as a school. And when it is um, scaled up, it becomes a hutong. And when it becomes scaled up again, the same pavilion with four walls creates the imperial uh, imperial forbidden city. And if we scale up and, uh, even further, the entire city and therefore the entire life or civilization itself is defined by walls and pavilions. So uh, uh, chapter four, I would call it the developmental city state. So the developmental city state is a term coined by Manuel Castel to describe the model of city making and governance of Singapore since the 1960s. And the way I wanted to, why I use the example of Singapore, because I thought that Singapore is a very, very unique has a very unique philosophical and political culture that is a hybrid between a parliamentary democracy that is inherited by the British, but one that is also in a way I would call a communitarian philosophical concept that still adheres very much to a Confucius uh, mindset. That is to say that the state takes on a moral leadership in the conceptualization and the transformation of the life of its citizens as a holistic project for the good. So, so within in Singapore, so perhaps you may notice within a short span of 50 years, the small city state has transformed itself from a third world country uh, uh, city state to a first world and has been a permanent fixture in the top spots of many city rankings in terms of its livability, competitiveness, and so on. And the success of the city, in fact, owes its constant remaking by the state, both as an idea of the city, as well as the evolving contract with a shared common knowledge of its dominant type that is used by every uh, leadership to transform the city, both as an idea as well as an artifact. So, so far, there's three prime ministers uh, in Singapore since its inception. And, and for every prime minister in Singapore, in their first national rally speech, is always used uh, to set out their vision of remaking the city and to relaunch each and every uh, political project that each uh, prime minister wants to pursue. So the first period uh, of Lee Kuan Yew is typified by what we call the mode of crisis of survival. This is because of the demerger from, uh, from Malaysia, therefore rendering the city-state without a hinterland, and in which the provision of public housing as a nation-building effort was on, done on a mammoth scale. The second, Go Chok Tong, in his uh, reign, ushered in a more relaxed version of the city, transforming the city into a resort-like verdant island with abundance of green that you see in Singapore today actually started in the 1990s. And the current Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong envisioned and repositioned Singapore as a top global city of the world with daring architecture uh, as showpieces, and this is still evolving. So again, with time very limited, I will focus on the first one. So uh, the, the first period, as I mentioned, has to do with, uh, uh, with the transformation of a a newborn nation into one that that has to take on a mode from a crisis of survival based on the demerger from Malaysia. And the Housing and Development Board was set up really is to rehouse these new citizens from slums to modern high-rise apartment. So this is this is essentially, as you see, as in the foreground, as the um, uh, slums were being demolished, you can see that construction is actually starting uh, at the very background itself. So the first generation of uh, housing here were largely slab blocks, 80 meter long, 12 story all they are laid out to avoid the east-west sun in its most rudimentary way, but constructed very, very rapidly. So this whole estate, for instance, was designed and built in less than three years. And also uh, quickly rolled out across uh, the new towns were 20 new towns taking on the same uh, project over the next 60 years. So whereby transforming Tabula Raza sites like this with architectures like this, uh, right, right up to this moment. 
And I would argue that uh, behind uh, this um, transformation of housing the nation were two dominant types, the high rise, uh, the, the, the high rise slab block and the high rise tower point block. And within that uh, a transformation from uh, over the past 15 to 20 years, one could see that the, the irreducible structure of the apartment buildings and the apartment layout is used almost as a social contract between the state and the citizens to in a way index the growing aspiration uh, of the citizen as one generation move into the housing to the other. And this can be seen very, very clearly here, for instance, from the top, top left right down to the bottom left, is that the first generation of public housing started off with almost like studio apartments uh, with dual uh, with uh, a double loaded corridor and with a central corridor running between and as families begin to grow aspiration begins uh, to be higher you can begin to see the evolution of larger units and as the units become larger you could see that the transformation of a singular corridor that is uh, centrally located became a debt access on the side. And as the units even become larger, they begin to inflect, begin to bend, so that they begin to create a, a, a more definable open space that, that uh, compared to the first one. And it's only after about 15 years that the what we call the point block was reintroduced. The point block is only possible only because we have uh, here four bedroom apartments. And that evolution together with the point block created much of the project that we see today in Singapore. It's a combination of slab block, a combination of high rise block to create neighborhoods and to create enclosable space. So. By 1989, so at the end of uh, Lee Kuan Yew's reign, 87% of the total population of 2.1 million people were living in public housing. So this is absolute, until today, it's about ranging about 82%. So this is the highest uh, uh, public housing numbers that you actually see in the world. So the overwhelming presence of 2.3 million of completed flats and housing housing more than 80% of the population really is a stark reminder of the ability of the state to take on a moral leadership to create not only a nation, but transforming all aspects uh, of life. And deep within this, the dominant type of the high rise uh, slab, as well as uh, uh, the point block, for me is ideological. It is a powerful symbol of the state's ability to fulfill its promise to improve the living conditions and in the creation of a nation. So how do we learn from this? So I'll just uh, quickly finish off with an example, what I call a common framework. So this is a project that we have done, completed about two years ago. Uh, precisely within the kind of housing estate, public housing estate that you see in Singapore that I've just mentioned to you uh, uh, earlier. So when we were first asked to work on this project as a competition, the brief that was given to us by the Singapore Development Board was for the creation of a new typology, an integrated neighborhood center that bring together communal amenities, shopping and polyclinic, sandwiched between uh, uh, LRT track at the south and then a waterway to the north. So the focus of the brief, unlike other developer driven commercial development, is to provide a high degree of public space to strengthen uh, community bonding. So when we were looking at this, essentially there is a shopping component, we asked ourselves, where do we look for, for precedent? So this is what we call a, a, the ubiquitous shopping mall uh, in Singapore, right? A superfluous monument of consumption uh, as a public activity. And its role is really to internalize all activities, drawing the lifeblood from the street and the city. But then on the other hand, polyclinics and hospitals in Singapore are designed like this often designed as independent building, set away from the other program and resources associated with the urban realm. So it is not unusual, therefore, now that you've heard me talk about the three episodes, is that where do we look for precedence? So we thought that with more than 80% of Singaporeans living in public housing, the architecture of Singapore's early HDB, I would say, that have grown over the years, that, be, that could be termed as a common architecture. 
one that has a, a certain equalizing uh, role as an artifact that is able to accommodate the plurality of life. And the architecture of HDB, especially those in the 70s and 80s, I would argue has this quality of an open framework, an unassuming structural expression of what it contains. And the Void Deck, uh, in fact, is one of the most successful containers of social life in Singapore, because on this ground floor is left completely open and only the structure from the above dwelling units are imprinted onto the ground. And I really love this because it, it really sometimes, uh, I would say that it moves from a certain poetic emptiness in wait for social life to unfold, as Rossi say, to here, for instance, in uh, in the space of celebration, this is a Malay wedding in uh, in 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 uh, the void deck, but also in the very same space, sometimes it's also used uh, in celebration or uh, or in death. So it is a space that is also used uh, by everyone to be at ease. So in other words, I could argue that this architecture acts as this larger open framework, a container of uh, social life. So our approach, therefore, is to draw upon this precedent and the architecture of public housing into a new typology. And we wanted to create this by suppressing the visual noise of the shopping center and the clinical architecture of hospital. So the way in which we've done this is in three ways. One is to incorporate landscape uh, as a, a, a horticultural activity that uh, creates a sense of community. The second uh, is to use uh, the to exaggerate in a way the void deck that I've mentioned to you. Uh, and then the third is to reinterpret the veranda space. So the, so the first move was really to allow the neighborhood center to be conceived of a singular building that frames and cradles a garden. So here you see that the garden almost cascade down almost like uh, and then opens up a, a proscenium to the waterway and create a natural amphitheater towards the water edge. So the garden cascades down the entire height and then with ramps that begin to zigzag up uh, from the ground floor all the way up. So as the, as the ramp zigzags all the way up, it begins to touch on every floor so that every floor on the building, on uh, the polyclinic site, as well as the shopping site, is able to access the garden and to be a seamless uh, space between the inside and the outside. So shopping is visible, uh, the, but, but the activity always uh, spills out into the veranda, but they do not drown out the public realm. So here, for instance, as the garden matures uh, in the past year, you can see that the ram now cuts through the terraces and then with each turn, revealing different pockets of communal space, a hammock, a seat, a platform to stretch out. And as you move towards the top and you turn your back around, the space begins to cascade down and the waterfront opens up in the horizon. So the top floor of the building is also uh, turned into a horticulture club for retirees and is very, very active if you begin to uh, visit it today. So the second element is, as I mentioned, is the exaggeration uh, on the larger scale of the void deck that, was, uh, that I spoke to you about. So it is four stories, it's sheltered from the tropical sun and the tropical rain. And when the sun becomes more searing, um, uh, it will be covered from uh, from the sun by this roller blinds that drops down. So we've made the uh, facade deliberately porous and it so that it defines and allows permeation from the outer space into uh, the inner space with a certain civic dignity as one passes through uh, the columns. And finally, uh, the veranda space is created almost as a thickened skin, an environmental buffer between the interior space and the harsh weather of the tropical climate. So you can see that the entire periphery of the building is created by this thickened skin so that all activities from the, the, the polyclinic as well as uh, the, the school and uh, the dining activities spills out close to the waterfront. So on a meta level, so we thought that the project offered us an opportunity to think about architecture's wider role in conceiving and cultivating a sense of community. So more often than not, architectures here like this ordinary architecture that are seen as restrained, rational and repetitive is derided for its lack of exuberance. But 
it is precisely this quality that I would argue that it is an architecture that is familiar to Singaporeans. And we should understand this architecture as a framework for accommodation. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, uh, for this uh, super interesting uh, uh, presentation. And as I said before, uh, introducing you, uh, it's it's very nice to see an architect that, I mean, as also we saw with the two previous presentations, who are really able to um, somehow uh, juggle with the kind of theoretical inquiry and, and, and design practice. Uh, and, and I found actually, uh, of course, it's always difficult to use a theory to justify design. We know that uh, it, it can lead to a lot of pitfalls, but I, I, I found the, the project uh, very, very well sustained actually by your uh, by your discourse and especially how you know how you frame the 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 concept of the eastern uh, uh, city you know as 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 a framework rather than as this uh, duality yes. artifact uh, let's say urban artifact and that which was actually also Rossi's uh, in a way understanding of the architecture of the city I mean it was very much based on this sort of uh, dichotomy you know the yes. the type as a, as something that is more related to the urban fabric yeah. and the urban artifact as actually the emergence yeah. you know the monument um, now, actually, my uh, my question to you is, uh, you know, to what extent this uh, model that you, I mean, this kind of return to this sort of balance, uh, to, you know, the art of balancing that is really typical of Confucian mm. ideology, to what extent uh, this uh, uh, position is uh, either critical or, I don't know, accommodating kind of... Uh, you know the 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 Asian way to neoliberalism. I mean, to to basically uh, a which of course Singapore is a is a bit of a yes. exception. I mean, it it twists things in yes. in, in that. Yes. Uh, so, to what extent this concept, in fact, that you put forward, uh, is uh, um, related to a strange kind of situation that is very difficult, different from the West, uh, where somehow you have a very extreme market economy, mm -hmm. but you still have a state. Mm -hmm in charge basically mm -hmm. uh so you know how how is is that you know if, if you would design some you know in in london what yes. what 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 would happen you you would completely miss all the whole yes. <laughs> framework <laughs> no it's a very good question people I, I think you're right if if um uh, to stay true to a typological reasoning and to use type as a heuristic device i would definitely work very differently if let's say our project is in London, precisely, uh, precisely uh, because of all the things that you have described. So uh, that's why I chose Singapore, both in terms of uh, uh, the historical framework, vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, looking at the Confucius ethics and then showing you the project, is that uh, a project that, like we have done, for instance, uh, Oasis Terrace, it would not be possible if it is a project that is purely driven by the market because all the provision of landscape spaces, the veranda spaces would be seen as completely inefficient, too much uh, um, a common area that is not that will not be able to produce a financial return. Yes. But it is possible because we uh, because this project in a way is the client is uh, housing development board, is the state. And the way in which we draw upon uh, the ideas, that underpins the project of city making by the state, they completely see it when we presented it. So that is why for us, we feel that the, the heuristic device of type is so important because it is no longer just about the concrete repeatable elements and, and shared elements that you look at, but more importantly, what is the idea that rules over the model again, right? What, what is the larger political and social project that the city in a way is th that finds critical yeah and of course here uh, with let's say the oasis terrace is to enable uh, the housing project to be successful but also one that is driven by landscape for instance right and and the way in which it it, uh, it cultivates spaces that respond to climate yeah
Any question? Yeah, Sila, uh, wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you for, for this very, very exciting presentation. I enjoyed a lot and also your project. So my question would be uh, two things indeed. I, I think the polyclinic also is a state public one, right? Yes. Okay. So it was a need probably in the in the area, in the neighborhood. So yes. that's why it's in the program requested. And uh, the second thing is because you started with Aristotle's politics. So I was wondering, because thinking about the Greek Agora or the Roman Forum, you know, the, the, this difference between the space of economics and space of politics, which the the citizens are included, but uh, out, I mean, not not all citizens, as we know. But then uh, what you suggest, or then let, later we see as with the square or piazza, plaza, whatever, is the space of politics itself. And at the same time, is the space of economics. So because you, you said that you were asked to produce a new typology, and it 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 is a... Uh, it, it looks like it, especially when when we consider the slab and tower block, yes. which has nothing to do with either the traditional, you know, the community making practices or the the market economy of today. Yes. So you you really suggest an in between or uh, a hybrid situation. But for instance, your your square, this sunken square, I do wonder if you also. Um, or if, if, if part of this community practices, because garden is very essential there and polyclinic, let's say, represents the state and the shopping mall or whatever, the shopping area, I think they're all private um, shops or companies. So then is it the square where this kind of political action in a way could occur or uh, I, I couldn't formulate, but it's rather, because I mean, following what, uh, what Pierre Vittorio said, because it can be, this typology also perfectly fit to this neoliberal scenario. Like it's kind of a public-private partnership. I mean, mm -hmm. we see it in, in terms of architecture. So then where, where is the, the public here? It's not the polyclinic or it's not the housing provided by the state. It is, but still there is a very strong market ideology. So then maybe I, I, I wonder, like, would you in, in a design process somehow consider this square as a space of political action or um, I don't know. Uh, yes. So yeah. I don't know if I could uh, formulate it. I'll, I'll try. If, if, if I should <laughs> like to include it the very beginning in the beginning that, that you mentioned, yes. again, in your project or new typology, yes. where is it? Is it the garden or this square? And I think it's the square, but maybe maybe culturally or because I'm really ignorant in Asian cultures, I have to say never been. And it's, it's maybe it's a different context. And yes. so yes, I, I see it less as a square. Actually, I see it as an exaggeration on a, a much larger scale of the void deck. So I see I see it less as a let's say a political space that we associate with the Western notion of the political as a space of protest, but as more of a social space, a social space that is uh, enlarged, precisely not because of the way in which, let's say, a plaza that you see in an Italian city that is defined by, let's say, the, the, the facade that, that encloses a negative space, but here it is defined by the columns, right? The columns that are enclosed on three levels and are exaggerated. In a way, that's so that when one uses that exaggerated space, uh, the residents or the citizens that uses it still finds a certain familiarity that they have seen in the void deck, that one story void, void deck that, uh, that I've seen. So in that sense, it becomes an extension of the partially domestic, partially common space that they have used. So in a sense, it's less the plaza but it's more of a scaled up, uh, exaggerated version of the void deck. Yeah. But I, I, I asked this also because this could also provide what, um, sorry. No, I asked, that, thank you for the answer. I asked this, maybe this could be a, a tool or uh, the, the thing that would solve this, this or that would suggest the balance, mm -hmm. or I don't know if it's balanced because I am also, for the controversies, let's say, uh, yes. for other reasons. So this may suggest maybe if we add this, then we may call it a new typology, in my opinion, because there is this very important political side of, of the, the thing. But yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, 
Any other question to to Chris? Yes. Please. Thank you, Chris. Wonderful presentation. Re really excited about the the historical reading of the Imperial City. And it's a bit of uh, track with what you discuss now, but I, I'm just curious to know your opinion on this like transposition or almost topology that the city becomes, this re endless reproduction of these relationships mm. at, at very different scales. And and I'm I'm just very curious to know your opinion on on the subject, right? Like what what kind of historical context um somehow frame this evolution and if you can explain a little bit or, or tell me your your ideas on what the repercussions on the subject were uh, precisely i don't know this is very broad but yeah it's, uh, I'll, I'll try <laughs> within a very short time so i, I would argue that uh, of course i use uh, the imperial city uh, pre-1948 before communist revolution of course with uh, with ccp coming into power this the the historical uh, imperial city change a little bit. But what I would still argue uh, that what still remains consistent is that uh, the creation of the city and more towards the conceptualization of the idea of the city is still very much uh, state driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although we seem to see that it is like from the outside, it's market-driven, it's capitalism. But when you work in China, you realize that you need to understand this role of the state as one that assumes the moral leadership mm -hmm. to, to understand the way in which the city is made. And once you understand that, I think one would work very, very differently. Yeah. I, I, in, in other words, I would say that it's the, the conceptual framework of this idea of the city still persists today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you, Chris. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, 